Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the art of negotiation with FBI special agent and counterterrorism expert, Thomas O'Connor. Learn what it takes to get what you want and negotiate like a pro with special agent tactics. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Hey Tom, how you doing? Jeep on the side of I-95 uh, as we're traveling the the uh, East Coast here. So, but hopefully everything will go and uh, uh, you can hear me and the wind isn't too bad and we're ready to roll. No, I mean it sounds great. I really exactly. appreciate you making time. I know you're I know you're enjoying the RV and uh, and again it's really we're really looking right. forward to talking to you today. I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone's logging on. We have the pleasure of uh, speaking with Tom O'Connor today. He is a nationally recognized counterterrorism expert. As background, he's a former FBI special agent and currently senior consultant at the SUFIN Group, which is a global intelligence and security firm. As an FBI special agent, Tom has worked on both international and domestic terrorism cases. Uh, he was a team leader in the Washington field office, leading forensic teams to multiple terrorist attacks around the globe. Uh, notable deployments include the Nairobi embassy uh, bombing, the Kosovo war crimes, the USS coal attack in Yemen, 9-11, of course, the U.S. consulate attacks in Pakistan, and six deployments to Iraq and three deployments to Afghanistan. So quite a background. Uh, Special Agent O'Connor has also worked at crime scenes, both of the 2018 Tree of Life synagogue shooting, as well as the 2019 Virginia Beach government building shootings. He's taught counterterrorism and negotiation tactics across seas, uh, he has been awarded the Department of Justice Instructor of the Year and was named by FBI as a Master Instructor. So really a pleasure to speak to you today, Tom. We're going to be talking about the no, art of negotiation, I, appreciate I find and, absolutely and, uh, fascinating. Thanks I for joining us. I also find uh, the tactics of negotiating and interviewing uh, people and, and uh, you know, getting people to work with you in that negotiation as the 37 years in law enforcement uh, probably – the most interesting part of the job was was exactly what you're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, let's get let's get a little background, right? You you spent many decades as a special agent. How did you? What kind so of training FBI, did you get in are, negotiations? Uh, what was your experience? Negotiators, with that? so people that when there's a hostage, uh, they go in and do that negotiation. I never uh, went to that um, area of expertise for negotiations. My my uh, negotiating skills were gained and utilized uh, during interview interrogations, uh, whether it be uh, here in the United States or overseas uh, with domestic uh, violent extremists and international terrorists. Um, and, and also in working with people uh, to assist in uh, the recovery of evidence, right? So that, that uh, when I say recovery of evidence, I'm talking about people becoming uh, confidential human sources, working with the FBI, working with law enforcement to gain information uh, through, through actually what people would perceive as undercover work as, a, as an informant. Um, and getting people to do that is, uh, is truly a negotiation because a lot of times it's against their best interests um, and you have to be able to, uh, you know, work with these people to, to explain why it would be a, a positive uh, for their future to do this. Uh, and there's many reasons people do it because they're in trouble and they want to get out of trouble. Uh, and that's, you know, that happens all the time. But I, I think one of the, the, uh, the most uh, rewarding types of uh, getting someone to come work with it, with you as a, as an uh, source is, is somebody who's doing it because a, through your, your ability to, to navigate with this person and, and work with them, they, they end up liking you uh, and, and then will work with you. And, and also because you can show them that it's the right thing to do. And, and some of these people are not, you know, a lot of these people are not from the 
the avenue of people that you would normally associate with, right? Uh, I worked domestic violent extremists. I worked a lot of cases on uh, white nationalists, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, uh, skinheads, this type of, of mentality. And to get someone from that uh, ideology to, to actually turn on their, uh, their comrades uh, because they believe that you um, are telling them the right thing and that it is the right thing to do to stop the violence um, is, is a, it, there's an art to that, right? To get to getting people to, to come in and assist. Um, also during interviews, uh, it, is, it is always a game of give and take with that. And back to the, the question that I've kind of veered off from, but how, what kind of training do you do? Uh, I was a police officer, local police officer for 15 years. And um, when I first started as a police officer, my goal was to go out there, write tickets, do the job that they hired you for, you know, people for drunk driving and handcuffs, assault and handcuffs. So people not given a lot of breaks, right? And uh, in 1990, I, I was chosen to be a detective uh, on the city police department. And I worked with uh, an older detective, um, Rusty Luce who is, was a mentor and still is. And Rusty really said to me, you know, you got to give some people breaks or no one's going to talk to you. And, you know, you don't need to lock up everybody. Uh, you need to work with people. And he, it just opened a whole new world of dealing with the community, working with the community and, and bringing, uh, you know, people on board uh, and through interviews and through negotiation of, bringing people to the, the table to work as informants, uh, I found it fascinating and, and did for my entire 37 years. So 23 in the FBI, 15 on local police departments. And, and that's really the best training you could possibly get for this. Unlike being a neurosurgeon is on the job training. You don't want to just show up, you know, pop, pop someone's skull for the first time and, and, and say, I'm going to learn no, how to do this. But when say. it comes to, this type of interview interrogation uh, work and, and that type of stuff, it, it really is doing it, uh, doing the job and, and, that, and working with good people. Now, you know, I want to ask you because many of our listeners might say, well, I'm never going to interact with yep. white extremists. Yep. I'm never going to interact with international terrorists. And that's valid. But give us some examples of why understanding how to negotiate everything and knowing the art of everything, negotiation right? I mean, is applicable it's, it's not like everyday you're going life. To market and bartering for uh you know to buy that rug uh you know you're gonna bring the person down in price you may but uh every everything we do in life is a negotiation or really should be uh i've been married 36 years that's 36 years of negotiating right and my wife uh, was an FBI agent. We were married 10 years before we both went into the FBI. She came in a year after I did. And she was also a very, very adept at uh, interview interrogation. So the two of us, when we were deciding, you know, say I wanted to buy, you know, a new bike and I had to negotiate with her, which was very difficult because she's good at this, right? But in, in life, uh, I think everything is a negotiation. If you if if everything that you do in life is, you know, black and white, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You're not going to get very far. You have to work with people. You have to, you know, if if you're talking about the business world, that's a constant negotiation in in just business uh, environment. It is a, a constant negotiation. Uh, I, I talked to a young man last night that has uh, done some uh podcasts and stuff, and he was watching um, uh, some masterclass stuff on negotiation. And it was related to, you know, how do I get a better salary? And you can't just walk in and say, All right, this is what I think I should be paid, because, you know, you're going to get countered, and that's it. Or you're going to get told, to, uh, you know, you no longer have a job or whatever. But you have to go into these things with as much uh, information and information is knowledge, right? So in any negotiation, whether you're going in to interview a uh, terrorist or if you're going in to, uh, to ask for more money at your job, have as much information. So you need to be able to have uh, 
like with with a terrorist, you need to know what their ideologies are. You need to know what family members they have. You need to know, you know, what what area of the world they live in. All these things uh, get into their, you know, in that world, get into their computers, get into their phones, find out what the things are. So when they start telling you things, you'll know that's not true. Uh, not only from their their signs that they're giving you, uh, you know, physically, but you know it through fact that this is not accurate. Now, you can't do that when you go in for your job, but you can know as much about your position, how much it's valued and why it's so important for you and go in there with that. Don't just walk in the door cold. I mean, let's talk about some of the important aspects of negotiation. Uh, you know, reading body language is critical, it sounds like. Tell us well, so the key I, I aspects to reading first, body language and how you interpret body those. Everybody's body language are, in some ways is going to be similar, right? Uh, but in a lot of ways, you have to uh, deal with the person to see what their their uh, their takes are, right? And and what their tells are, if you're, you're, you're talking about things that they do. Um, in, in the FBI, in the interview interrogation uh, format, it is very important that we build rapport. And that's done for several, several reasons. One of them being, you're getting a feel for this person, and you're talking to them. And it can be uh, for a, a long period of time over several interviews, where you're, you're talking to this person, and trying to find out what, what types of things, when you know, they're telling you a lie, are they doing? And do they repeatedly do that? Um, one of the, the basic things, and you know, anybody can go online and look this stuff up, but one of the basic things is uh, you know, grooming. When, when people uh, tend to start straying down the, the avenue of not telling you uh, full truths, many times they'll, they'll start doing things uh, you know, with, their, with their face and, and grooming techniques show you that eh, something may be a little bit of miss here, right? Um, and so as you do build this rapport, you're also uh, building your library of what this person does. And, and, a, and a, a great t a case example of that, if I can, if I can give one, is uh, in Iraq in 2005, I, both my wife and I and a, a small team from the Washington field office were deployed to a detention facility to work with the military in uh, interviewing subjects came off the battlefield and are they uh, terrorists? Are they somebody that just got rolled up and needs to get uh, you know, shown the gate and go home? Uh, and, and so that's very important, very long hours. And my uh, specific uh, goal was to work towards hostages that were taken in the Iraqi uh, area of operations. So a gentleman was brought into uh, to me to, to speak to. There was some information that he had knowledge of uh, hostages that had been taken. And at the time in 2005, there were several outstanding hostages. One of them was a U.S. citizen named Roy Hallams. And uh, Roy was a contractor and was uh, taken in a uh, raid by extremists on the compound. They took him, and he had been held at that time for about 300 and probably maybe 309 days. Uh, and had there were a couple of videos that came out, uh, but not a whole lot of, of information as to where this subject was. Um, I sat down with this, this uh, person and through an interpreter, which also puts another layer of, of uh, difficulty in it, but you have to have a really good translator interpreter uh, that is not just adding their own, uh, you know, kind of uh, flash to the comments that the person's giving you, you need to have that person giving you exact translation of what, what that person just said. And if you raise your voice or lower your voice, that person does the exact same thing. So they are completely mimicking your, uh, your, your uh, comments and, and, and questions, and they're doing the same back. So we were very lucky to work with uh, a FBI uh, linguist who was exceptional. And we sat down with this uh, guy and um, the rapport building went for about four hours before we started talking about uh, any hostages, wow. really. Um, it was just all the things that many times they'll tell you, oh no, when you get a, a terrorist in, in the box to talk to, 
you can't uh, you can't bring up religion because that, you know that's going to be a, a big hot topic and that's going to send things off. Well, you got to kind of weigh that. But with this guy, I talked about politics. I talked about uh, religion. I talked about family. I talked about my family fictitiously. Uh, and um, if he could tell I was lying, saying that I have you know kids and all this stuff, but to build this in with him. So after about five hours, I started talking, or four hours, I started talking about the hostages that we had outstanding that we were looking for. And I had photographs of each one of them and talked about each one of them, tried to humanize that uh, hostage to this person who we believed was involved in hostage taking. Uh, and, and, you know, this person has a family. This person wants to be back with their family. And uh, after about five hours, this person took a picture of Roy Hallams that was on the table, slid it over to me, and through the, uh, the linguist said, tell this man I'm going to tell him something I've told no one else. And I was like, okay, this, he needs to take a shower. He, you know, what, what is it going to be? And it turned out to be a gold mine. Uh, he said, uh, Roy is still alive. And we, had, we really had no concrete information that Roy was still alive. Uh, he told me that uh, when you go to where he is, you will, will not be able to find him. I'm like, okay, so here we go. He's just kind of throwing things out. He said, because when you go into this house, you're going to have to move a refrigerator, pull back a rug, chisel up a floor, a big slab of cement, lift the slab of cement, and there's actually a hole under the house. And in Iraq, the majority of homes do not have basements. Uh, and so the special forces team, we were, he, but the one thing he wouldn't give me was the location. Uh, but, okay, so, but he said to me, he goes, I know how you found me. There's a name in my phone. This is the name. This guy knows where it is. Now, I knew that he knew where this place was because there's no way that he had the detail of, of that. But let's, I just, kind of, let's go with that and see if we can get a location through this other person. That person was uh, picked up by special forces. We went down to this other location, myself and this other man I had started talking with. And as we walked by the room where this other person was being spoken to, uh, I put my arm around this guy and started laughing. I didn't speak Arabic. He doesn't speak English. But the man sitting in that other room saw me, uh, an American, walking with his friend, laughing. And he's like, what do you think then, right? The gig is up, right? So he, uh, the, the military did an outstanding job. They got the location. They uh, sent out the teams. They landed. Uh, they you know, went into that house, they went to the location, they moved the refrigerator, they pulled back the rug, they chiseled up the floor, peeled that back. Uh, and, um, you know, amazing heroes these guys are, they go into that hole, not knowing what's there, and they find Roy Hallams and another uh, Kurdish uh, young man who was also held hostage. So Roy was held for 311 days. There was no interest in this and the gentleman who I spoke to, there was no personal gain by him telling me the truth. It was through the rapport building and, and negotiation back and forth in discussions that he began to trust me. And was, I was able to, I believe, show him that Roy Helms was a good man, a human being. And uh, if you're a religious person, that this is the right thing to do. And he did it. Uh, so that's a lot of negotiation between people who normally on a day would not, uh, you know, see eye to eye on anything. Uh, and, and Roy was recovered from, uh, you know, that one piece of, I, I like to put it, it was a, a huge wheel of uh, intelligence. And that interview was that one spoke that uh, led to the location where everything, everything else came together. So uh, amazing teamwork. But the interview uh, and the negotiations with that subject was extremely important in, in bringing back a U.S. hostage. I mean, so you were talking about building rapport, obviously very important for any kind of negotiation. You talked about body language, the tells. What about speech well, patterns? You know, How much can you tell about you, speech patterns you when you're negotiating with, with someone? someone? During that uh, rapport building phase, you're going to note 
when different things they say, right? And one of the things that I found in my career was when, when somebody uh, tells you that they swear to God that this is the truth, <laughs> they're likely lying to you because God doesn't come into this, right? Uh, and people will I swear <laughs> on my, my, uh, my dead mother's grave. And when that stuff starts coming in, that's a little bit too much, right? Just tell me the truth. You don't need to accent it with, I'm, you know, bringing in uh, your, whatever it is that you bring into the, into play. And a lot of times as you talk to somebody and you, and you have to like, it's like anything else, right? You have to uh, corroborate that, that uh, what that person is saying to you in, in much smaller lies that they may use that same type of thing. And the only way you're going to know that that is a lie is if you've done your homework on the front end. Uh, so in any negotiation, knowing uh, as many facts as you possibly can about the person you're about to go into negotiations with is key because then you can find, you can see those, those ticks. You can, you know, see those verbal, uh, you know, words that they use, different things that they repeatedly use. And if they've done it on small lies, they're going to use it on larger ones. But let me ask you, you know, let's say you know someone's lying, either speech patterns, body language, you know, all the stuff that we've covered so, so far. Many times when you know someone's lie, lying, right? how do you uh, respond? If you're talking about in a criminal uh, context, you want to get that person to lie to you as much as you can. That's great. If somebody's lying to me, let them lie. Get it on paper, right? Get, get their story on paper that's a lie, and you can uh, then poke holes in it with facts. I, I give you two uh, examples that, that, that uh, took place. There was a, a young woman who was uh, kidnapped and murdered. Her body was found uh, um, in, in uh, Maryland, and her car was found in Virginia. And uh, the boyfriend was one of the, the main suspects, ex-former boyfriend. And so my wife, Jean, and I were uh, assigned to forensically review this vehicle for uh, any type of physical evidence that could possibly be of uh, assistance in the investigation. So for the people in Pennsylvania who were doing the actual sit down with the, with the boyfriend, we wanted to have as much knowledge as we could. So the boyfriend says, uh, I've never been to Ocean City, Maryland, never been there. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what you guys are talking about. We haven't dated in, in uh, several weeks and I, I was, I've never been there. That's great. Get that person on, on undocumented that that person has never been to Maryland. So Gene and I, we then uh, search the vehicle in the, back of the car, we find a bag of uh, trash from a fast food place. And we submit uh, the trash and you don't just take it and throw it out as trash, right? You submit that, that uh, to the lab for fingerprints and for uh, DNA and this type of thing, because this subject had been in that car. His DNA is going to be in that car. Uh, his fingerprints are going to be in that car. So it takes away from what, what important forensic, uh, uh, evidence you're going to find because there's legitimate reason for it is there, right? Inside this bag is uh, a a large, like a big gulp kind of soda and a, a burger wrapper. And then there's a salad and a, a water bottle. So you could say likely that the the woman the who was murdered uh, had the salad and the water, potentially. And the guy had the big gulp and the burger, right? So we submit those in for, for uh, DNA, and it comes back with his DNA on the, the, the big gulp and the burger wrapper, hers on the, on the uh, salad and water. Now, okay, how long has that been there? Now, you know, when, when you go to a burger place and you get from the drive through they hand you your bag, they throw the receipt in there. The receipt is in the bag, and it says Ocean City, Maryland, on a given date. So now we know his DNA is in that bag and uh, with a receipt from Ocean City, Maryland, where he lied and said, I've never been there, okay? So uh, they go back to this fast food place. They get the video uh, of the car. I'll take my food and 
Now you have video evidence of him in, in, in Maryland, in Ocean City, Maryland. You have DNA evidence of him in Ocean City, Maryland. And you've got him lying that he has never been there. Now investigators go back, sit back down with him, and show him the facts, right? And you, you can't lie to this person because he knows the truth. Right. So you have to, you know, you can, oh, you know, the old uh, put the papers on the thing. These are your fingerprints that we found all over the place. Well, if the guy was wearing gloves, he knows you don't have anything. So you have to be very careful not to lie in those negotiations. Right. So this person is convicted for first degree murder because clearly he's got nothing to do besides plea uh, to, to the, the crimes. Another case uh, where I sat down with a subject who was involved in a, a large shooting event. And uh, he said uh, during this interview that he had been uh, fired upon by, and this was overseas, he had been fired upon by uh, insurgents from an area uh, in Baghdad that was behind this big dirt mound. And I had been to Baghdad. I had searched that area. I had literally searched that dirt mound. And I knew that I found absolutely no uh, bullet or bullet fragments in that dirt mound. Whereas if he was firing at insurgents, he would have been putting rounds there. And there were no shell casings of any type in that area. Uh, and there were shell casings in other locations. So it's not that like, they were cleaned up. So we let him go through his, uh, you know, I took fire from this location and, uh, and then said, okay. I said to him, do you watch CSI? And he said, yeah. Yeah, I watched CSI. I said, well, I'm, I'm CSI. And, and I was in Baghdad and I searched that location and I didn't find any of the things you're telling me. So I know you're lying to me. And at that point, he and his lawyer did a little bit of whispering. Can we have a minute? Came back in. Now he's going to tell you the truth. So using your homework, your, uh, you know, doing as much as you possibly can before you go into that negotiation is key to, uh, and it doesn't have to be a criminal case, it can be anything. Uh, have as much information, sit down with that person for as, as long as you can, so that you can tell what their, their signs are, what words they use, what, what gestures they use when you think they're telling uh, a, a falsehood, uh, and then, then you can build it from there. Now, let me ask you a question. Who has more control in a negotiation? The person speaking so or the I, person I, listening? I, and a great how do you gain question. the upper hand? Uh, and my wife will, will tell me uh, when I'm doing interviews, and we've done many of them together overseas and, and in the States, is little less this, little more this, right? So for, for the, the person doing the interview, the person that's trying to get something, and, and the interviewer, the agent or you're the person that's trying to get something in this, in this negotiation. Um, listening is key. Get as much information from that person as well as your homework beforehand uh, to, to go into this, this battle, right. Uh, to try and do it. So I think at, it's, it may shift at some point that uh, the person who's listening uh, is as long as that other person's talking, um, then you're winning, right? And one of the one of the, the things that is is key is um, as, as you're negotiating or as you're interviewing someone. Uh, personally, I'm from Massachusetts. I talk a lot. I talk fast. Uh, I don't like dead space in a conversation. It drives my wife nuts when she's talking to somebody. She can she can sit there and have no nothing going on. Me, it drives me nuts. I'm the type of person that you want to be going after, right? Because if you're the interviewer and you just all of a sudden leave that dead space, most people, myself being one, feel the need to fill that space and talk. So the listening portion of it also gives you the ability with people is to give them a chance to talk, make them feel uncomfortable in that silence and they'll talk more than you uh, want them to, uh, in a lot, in a lot, or more than they want to. Now, what about mirroring and labeling? I was just reading a little bit about that. Yeah. I find it fascinating how you can essentially allow a person to present you with your deal and they think it's their idea. Uh, how exactly do you do that? So, the, I mean, 
that is the, 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 the win, right? If you can sell something to somebody and make them think that it is their idea, um, then that you're fully supported. Right. Uh, in, a, in a business deal, if it's their idea and you're all of a sudden just going, oh, that's that's I think that's a great idea. You don't need to take the uh, you know, the win is that you don't take credit for it. You just get what is needed to be done, done. And uh, so in in mirroring, it's a, it's very simple when you're talking to someone uh, and you're watching them, you know, shaking their heads and doing this stuff. It naturally if, like as as you've done many classes and this type of stuff, you see your class out there. If your class is just sitting there like this, you're like they're not they're not getting this, right? But if you're if you're talking to them and they're giving you some of this positive feedback, that gives gives the teacher the feeling that all right, I'm they get it, they agree with me, they understand me, uh, and it's the same thing uh, in a negotiation or, or an interview is that type of mirroring uh, is very, very beneficial to, you know, crossing arms there, you know, when people cross their arms during an interview, many times, and it could just be that that's their comfort zone, but a lot more often it is they're guarding themselves, right? They're pulling in and they'll, they may be sitting at a table open armed. And then all of a sudden you get to that one point that is the most important point you're trying to get to. And they sit back, they'll, they'll cross their arms, they'll cross their legs. And they're, they're literally protecting their core from something that they feel they're being attacked by uh, because you're getting to the meat of it. I, I had the opportunity, um, the, uh, Augusto Pinochet was the, the president of Chile and, and there were, they, uh, the, under his regime, there was a bombing in, in Washington, D.C. in the 70s. And um, it was believed uh, that he was behind the bombing uh, through surrogates. And so uh, as a very young agent, I just I lucked out and was given the rebirth of the Pinochet case and went to Chile and Argentina and all different places uh, and literally went to uh, a prison setting uh, to speak to a guy named uh, Manuel Contreras, who was uh, one of the he was a colonel and general under Pinochet and did some of the most heinous uh, things to their their political uh, adversaries. And um, we wanted him to, to, to talk about this bombing in Washington, DC. And he was now in prison for other things. He was getting older. Uh, my research and our, our background showed that he was a very religious person. So my, our goal, and this was with the US Attorney's Office and another agent, our goal was to, to get him to start talking about this stuff that happened back in the 70s because he's getting old. Maybe you want to clean your soul before you, you go on to the next, uh, you know, wherever. And um, whenever we got to a one of those sticking points, he would do exactly that. He would sit back like this, and then uh, the prison guards would come in and offer us bread to break the, the, the whole, like, it's a, it's a, once you get the person on this thing, you want to keep that uninterrupted uh, because the, the more you can work on that, you don't want to say, okay, we're going to take a break. We're just about to get where we want to go. We're going to take a break. And that's what happened there. But his tells were that clear every time wow. we got to something. And, and many, many times you'll get people who will, will hey, hey, tell me, tell me about that shooting or, or whatever, the, the, uh, a rape or whatever the, the crime was. And they'll give you detailed information in writing about everything they did that morning, everything they did that afternoon. And if the crime took place in the, in the uh, evening, then all of a sudden it was like, and then I went to bed next morning, I woke up. And so we got a lot of detail here. You get nothing here. It tells me that this person's lying to me. And you can get that in writing and you want to get that in writing, right? Documented, videoed uh, in your interview so that you can, once you poke holes in that, uh, then this person's statement is going to be used against them, right? I mean, that, it, the old, a, the, the old Miranda a, rule. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it's such a chess game. You know, 100%. it seems like you're literally, you're kind of reading them, they're reading you, and you're trying to bait them 
to open up. And I think it's such an interesting tactic. Tell me a little bit about the value of saying no in a negotiation and tactical empathy. Do those two go together? And they can. I, I think they can, right? You, you want to, um, when, when a person really starts going down the road of where they think, you know, my mother would call it, uh, they're, they're treating you like a gamel. It's a, a, an Irish clown, right? And so if, if this person is, is treating you like that, like that, you know, clown, and they're just lying through their teeth to you about the whole thing, and they think they're, that's great to get on, on paper and everything, but at some point you got to say, all right, enough's enough. Here's, here's where we start telling the truth. And, th and that's that no, right? Uh, and, and the empathy part of it, um, it's one of these things that, that uh, I think the general public would uh, be, and, and officers and agents are, are the same thing, but you, you have uh, child pornographers, uh, child rapists, this stuff. And, and I've you know, been in interviews with, with people that have done horrendous things. And you, you can, one of the tactics is to almost normalize it um, and, and that's literally one of the things that these people are looking for. And that's why online, right, all, the, all these child predators are going online because they realize that their family ever finds out about this, they're going to say, you know, that's, that's wrong. That's, uh, you know, if the, if the community finds out about it, you know, having sex with a child is wrong. But they go to the Internet to, to these web groups of other people who feel the same way they do. And, uh, and it reinforces it and makes it uh, it's less wrong, right? They, they may, in the back of their head, know it's wrong, but they've got all these people that are passing videos and all this stuff, and, and, it, 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 and you, can, you can take that to the political level in our environment today, where people go to the, the location where they want to hear what they already believe because they want to believe that it is legitimate. Right. They don't go to the other side and listen to the other side. They go to where they only want to go. And that happens on both sides of our political divide in the country. So um, showing empathy for somebody who's done a heinous crime is very difficult. But it is it is a tactic where it, where it will uh, assist you in many cases where it makes this person feel that you understand what their what drove them to this and that they're not a bad person they may have done a bad thing but they themselves are not a bad person and that, that uh is is a tactic that is used over and over um and you know that's where law enforcement uh you know has had problems in their their own psyches because you're dealing with these monsters and during interviews you have to you know get down in the gutter with them yeah. um and and, and that's the same with, with uh, building sources, right? You, the, my, my white nationalist, white supremacist sources, uh, I became very good friends with some of these guys. You know, uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, confidential human sources of all times, he's deceased now, uh, but he was a big guy and he had a tattoo on his chest and it was a photograph of Martin Luther King, right? And it had a sniper scope around it. And on the top, it says, I have a dream. And on the bottom, it said, and mine came true. So as, you know, awful as that possibly can be, once we got to a point where we were working on this stuff, this guy uh, turned that corner and was extremely helpful 